Hello and welcome viewers, you are watching this special presentation of Sunset TV on organs of government. A government normally functions by dividing its functions between its organs, with each organ performing some specific functions. It primarily performs three main functions, making of laws, enforcing the laws and resolving disputes. In this edition, we will focus on three organs of the government and their functions. We will also try and understand the relationship between these organs. So come along. As a community of persons permanently occupying a definitive territory, legally independent of external control and possessing an organized government, which creates and administers law over all persons and group within its jurisdiction is called a state. Effective and efficient governance is the expectation of every civilized society. This role is performed by the government, which is one of the four essential elements of the state, along with population, sovereignty and territory. No state is possible without a government, which not only provides security to the people, but also looks after their basic needs and ensures their socio-economic development. At independence, India was not merely large and diverse but also deeply divided. A constitution designed to keep the country together and to take it forward had necessarily to be an elaborate, carefully worked out and painstakingly drafted document. For one thing, it sought to heal the wounds of the past and the present to make Indians of different classes, castes and communities come together in a shared political experiment. For another, it sought to nurture democratic institutions in what had been a long culture of hierarchy and deference. In one of his speeches to the Constituent Assembly, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, while underlining the importance of constitutional morality, emphasized that the essence of constitutional morality was to regard the Constitution as supreme and to follow the constitutionally mandated procedures regardless of any ideological differences. All three organs of the state, persons gracing the constitutional posts, Members of the civil society and common citizens of India are expected to abide by constitutional morality. Dr. Ambedkar ne is vishay ke upar Swidhan ka nirman hoti se mein kya kaha? I will invite your attention. I quote: The Constitution can provide. I am quoting Dr. Ambedkar. The Constitution can only provide the organs of the state, such as legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. provide The great man, father of Indian Constitution, architect of Indian Constitution, further says, I quote, the factors on which the working of those organs of the state depends on the people and political parties. Democracy blossoms. Democracy survives when legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, they act in togetherness. They act in tandem so that expressions of the people are realized. Dr. Rajendra Prasad, a president of the country for 10 years and chairman of the Constituent Assembly, a celebrated figure, what he said. And that is a question. He said that he was a person. He was a I quote, if the people who are elected and capable and men of character, they would be able to make best even of a defective constitution. If they are lacking in this, the constitution cannot help the country. After all, a constitution like a machine is a lifeless thing. For articulating the aspirations of the people, there are three organs of government in India. The legislature, which makes the laws, the executive, which implements them, and the judiciary, which interprets laws and decides disputes. The organs of the government are so structured that they can adequately perform the functions required of them.
the makers of the indian constitution wanted to show that the government would be sensitive to public expectations and would be responsible and accountable the other alternative to parliamentary executive was the presidential form of government but the presidential executive puts much emphasis on the president as the chief executive and as source of all executive powers there is always a danger of personality cult in presidential executive the makers of indian constitution wanted a government that would have the strong executive branch but at the same time enough safeguards should be there to check against the personality cult in the parliamentary form there are many mechanisms that ensure that the executive will be accountable and controlled by the legislature or people's representatives so the constitution adopted the parliamentary system of executive for the governments both at the national and state levels according to this system there is a president who is the formal head of the state of india and the prime minister and the council of ministers which run the government at the national level at the state level the executive comprises the governor and the chief minister and council of ministers the constitution of india vests the executive power of the union formally in the president in reality the president exercises these powers through the council of ministers headed by the prime minister in this formal sense the president has wide ranging executive legislative judicial and emergency powers in a parliamentary system these powers are in reality used by the president only on the advice of the council of ministers the prime minister and the council of ministers have support of the majority in the lok sabha and they are the real executive before the 91st amendment act of 2003 the size of the council of ministers was determined according to exigencies of time and requirements of the situation but this led to very dark size of council of ministers besides when no party had a clear majority there was a temptation to win over the support of the members of the parliament by giving them ministerial positions as there was no restriction on the number of the members of the council of ministers this was happening in many states also therefore an amendment was made that the council of ministers shall not exceed 15% of total number of members of the house of the people the prime minister acts as a link between the council of ministers on one hand and the president as well as the parliament on the other it is also the constitutional obligation of the prime minister to communicate to the president all decisions of the council of ministers relating to the administration of the affairs of the union and proposals for legislation meanwhile the vice president elected for 5 years is also the part of the executive his election method is similar to that of president the only difference is that the members of state legislatures are not the part of the electoral college the vice president acts as the ex officio chairman of the rajya sabha and takes over the office of the president when there is a vacancy or otherwise the vice president also acts as the president only until a new president is elected besides political executive we also have permanent executive the permanent executive that is the bureaucracy is involved at every stage of the decision making process and maintains continuity in administration often the political executive depends on the bureaucrats because of their technical expertise and knowledge the opening and last sentences of the preamble we the people adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution on court signifies a power is ultimately vested in the hands of the people parliament of india is a supreme legislative body which reflects the will of the people as in other parliamentary democracies the parliament of india has a cardinal function of legislation overseeing the administration passing the budget ventilation of public grievances and discussing various subjects like plans national policies and international relations manani sabha sadu manani sabha pati ji it is where our laws are framed the country's future is debated and the people's representatives are held accountable it is india's seat of government and all the important laws are passed right here in this iconic circular edifice parliament of india Parliament is a supreme legislative body and a living epitome of freedom and sovereignty of the people of India. 
It occupies a preeminent and pivotal position in India's democratic polity. The distribution of powers between the Union and the states followed in the Constitution emphasizes in many ways the general predominance of Parliament in the legislative field. Apart from a wide range of subjects, even in normal times, the Parliament can, under certain circumstances, assume legislative power with respect to a subject falling within the sphere exclusively reserved for the states. The Parliament is also vested with powers to impeach the President and to remove the judges of Supreme Court and High Courts, the Chief Election Commissioner and Controller and Auditor General in accordance with the procedure laid down in the Constitution. Legislature of the Union, which is called Parliament, consists of the President and two houses known as the Council of States or the Rajya Sabha and the House of People or the Lok Sabha. Each of the two houses of Parliament has different bases of representation. The Rajya Sabha represents the states of India. It is an indirectly elected body. Residents of the state elect members to the state legislative assembly and the elected members of these assemblies in turn elect the members of the Rajya Sabha. The Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies are directly elected by the people. For the purpose of election, the entire country is divided into territorial constituencies of roughly equal population. One representative is elected from each constituency through universal adult franchise, where the value of vote of every individual would be equal to another. At present, there are 543 constituencies. This number has not changed since 1971 census for the Lok Sabha. Basic of any basic structure is supremacy of the people, sovereignty of the people, sovereignty of the parliament. In any society, disputes are bound to arise between individuals, between groups, and between individuals or groups and government. All such disputes must be settled by an independent body in accordance with the principle of rule of law. The principal role of the judiciary is to protect rule of law and ensure supremacy of law. The judges may be nominated by the head of the state or appointed by following a process of selection or elected or co-opted by fellow judges across the world. In India, judges are appointed through collegium system. It is a system of appointment and transfer of judges that has evolved through judgments of the Supreme Court and not by an act of parliament or by a provision of the constitution. The constitution of India provides for a single integrated judicial system. The structure of the judiciary in India is pyramidal with the Supreme Court at the top, high courts below them and district and subordinate courts at the lowest level. The lower courts function under the direct superintendence of the high courts. The first and the foremost function of the courts is the administration of justice. The courts hear and decide cases of all civil, criminal and constitutional nature. In countries having written constitutions, the courts are also entrusted with the power of interpreting the constitution. The constitution lays down the structure and defines, delimits and demarcates the role and functions of every organ of the state, including the judiciary, and establishes norms for their interrelationships, checks and balances. The doctrine of separation of powers implies that each pillar of democracy, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary, perform separate functions and act as separate entities. The doctrine is a part of the basic structure of Indian constitution. The legislative branch is responsible for enacting the laws of the state and appropriating the money necessary to operate the government. The executive branch is responsible for implementing and administering the public policy enacted and funded by the legislative branch. The judicial branch is responsible for interpreting the constitution and laws and applying their interpretations to controversies or disputes brought before it. The constitution of India embraces the idea of separation of powers in an implied manner, despite there being no expressive provision recognizing the doctrine of separation of powers in its absolute form. The constitution does make the provisions for a reasonable separation of functions and powers between the three organs of the government. 
constitutional provisions ensuring separation of power are Article 50, which says that state shall take steps to separate the judiciary from the executive. Articles 121 and 211, which says that judicial conduct of a judge of the Supreme Court at the High Courts cannot be discussed in Parliament and the state legislature. Articles 122 and 212, which says that validity of proceedings in Parliament and the legislatures cannot be called into question in any court. Article 361, which says that President or the Governor shall not be answerable to any court for the exercise and performance of the powers and duties of his office. All constitutional institutions, the legislature, the executive, the parliament, are required to be within their limits. One must not make incursion in the domain of the other. We all have to confine to a deep sense of propriety, self-respect, and commitment to the Constitution. इस संविधान में जो मर्यादा दी है, उस मर्यादा का पालन न्यायपालिका भी करें। न्यायपालिका से भी अपेक्षा की जाती है कि जो उनको संविधानिक मेंडेट दिया गया है, वो उस मेंडेट का उपयोग करें, लेकिन अपनी प्रत्यक्ष शक्तियों के प्रथम करण और संतुलन को के सिद्धांतों को बनाने में भी सहयोग करें यह अपेक्षा हमारे पीठासीन अधिकारियों की है और इसीलिए विधायिका कार्यपालिका न्यायपालिका को संविधान ने शक्तियां दिए क्षेत्र अधिकार दिया है और क्षेत्र अधिकारों में रहकर हम किस तरीके से और जनता का भरोसा विश्वास जीत सकते हैं इसके लिए हमें काम करने की आवश्यकता है The governance of any country requires the making of laws, their execution and interpretation, which is carried out by the legislature, executive and the judiciary respectively. Thus, all organs of government have their own assigned roles and at the same time they are also linked to each other. It is upon their harmonious functioning that a political system acquires stability as well as vitality. The doctrine of separation of powers seeks to protect the centralization of power in one hand. The application of this principle makes the government liable, accountable, answerable to its citizens for its actions, thereby aiding in the promotion and protection of human rights. Well, viewers, that's all we had for you in this edition. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Sunset TV.